Olá, pessoal. Eu sou o Ronaldo Lemos, sou advogado, especialista em tecnologia, fundador do ITS Rio. Estou aqui hoje junto com a Embratel e o Valor Econômico para falar dentro da série Vamos Habilitar o Próximo Nível sobre um tema que é fundamental, inteligência artificial e seu impacto para governança e para a ética. A gente sabe que a inteligência artificial está avançando de forma muito rápida, tanto para a gente no nosso uso do dia a dia, mas também para empresas e governos, e os aspectos éticos e regulatórios avançam de forma um pouco mais devagar. E para falar sobre tudo isso, ninguém melhor do que a Kay Firth Butterfield, que é advogada, ela é professora, já trabalhou durante muito tempo no Fórum Econômico Mundial com esse tema e foi uma das primeiras Chief AI Ethics Officer do planeta. Vamos falar com ela. So Kay, it's really a pleasure to be talking with you. Thank you so much. And we'll be talking about a Uh, you know, something that is moving so fast, which is AI. So my first question for you is, how do you keep pace with this thing that moves so fast? Well, it's hard, isn't it? And it's, I should say first, it's such a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you for inviting me. But To your question, it's really hard to keep up because it is moving so fast. But there are some things that I always read. I'm always talking to companies and governments about AI design, development and use. And so there's always something new every day. It's important to keep up. But I think that, you know, one depends upon one's employees and one's colleagues, and uh, the folks that you talk to as well. Absolutely. You are a lawyer, so I'm very interested in how AI started to become part of your career. What happened that you ended up like basically working with AI and AI ethics? How did you get there? Ah, uh, sure, yes. Um, I think it is a continuous path because, you know, I'm a human rights lawyer. Then being a judge as a barrister in the UK, we're the ones who wear the wigs and gowns. I was writing a book about human rights and human trafficking at the time. And this led me to really think deeply about superintelligence. And that's what maybe the five or ten of us who happen to be in academia thinking about AI at that stage um, was talking about. So I was very interested, I became very interested in what would it mean for humans in a, in a, in a world where we had super intelligent AI. And I wrote, I finished my book in December 2012, in 2014, I became the world's first chief AI ethics officer for a small nonprofit here in Austin, Texas. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> you, you were very early at this conversation. And actually, this leads me to, to another question to you. So as we, we mentioned, things are moving really fast. What do you see as the main developments of AI right now? What, what is calling your attention? What, what do you think are the, the opportunities, the risks? What should we be aware of at this moment? Well, you know, we could talk about that question, which is a huge question for uh, the rest of the day. I think I am very excited at the moment about uh, drug discovery and some of the ways in which we can use AI in healthcare. But on the other side of that, you asked me about risks, and I think there are huge risks of using AI in healthcare and in the education, because basically we're sort of beta testing on the most vulnerable people in the world. And so we really need to be thinking very carefully about governance around artificial intelligence used in both of those fields, but they are both fascinating and potentially really um, able to push us forward 
um, as as a species and hopefully in the right direction. We've also seen, obviously, autonomy in cars. But what we're seeing, what we will see and what we're beginning to see is those autonomous agents really moving into business, government, everywhere, our personal lives. And a great example, I think, of that is agentic AI, which um, has been making autonomous agents for insurance companies. And with, in one insurance company, uh, the, it's now doing the job of previously 700 people in underwriting. And so I think there is a real, um, real risk and benefit from autonomous agents, and that's where we should be looking in 2025. What do you think uh, corporations should do in regards of how to govern AI? What is the, the path to take? And what is your experience uh, being uh, probably one of the first chief AI ethics officer? How do we approach governance in the corporate world? Well, we've come a long way since 2014 when I started um, actually in, uh, in the corporate. And as you say, in Brazil, you're going to, I believe the act is in the Senate. And it looks very much like the EU AI Act. And so I think it makes it much easier, actually, for corporations now to think about good governance because uh, you have examples of what governance looks like. And, and if you don't want to go into the EU AI Act, which is quite complex, we do in the States have the NIST framework for good governance. Beyond the regulatory frameworks, I think that it's ju it just makes sense for companies to really think carefully about the following. One is that many of their employees are really frightened about whether AI will take their jobs. Many of those employees might be your customers um, or in a B2B setting, you've, you've got people who are frightened about losing their jobs in one company and you've got, cust and, and you've got customer fear as well. Uh, your customer doesn't want to be buying AI, which might not be well governed. So you've got those sort of fears going on uh, at that top level and within your company. What that means is that you really have to, as a company, ensure three things. The first is, does your board know anything about AI, let alone governance of AI? And what we know is that there are not many technologists sitting on boards at the moment. So you need either to train your board or to bring in somebody to that board. Human resources is a high-risk use of AI. So if you've got your human resources person doing that and you've got the CTO doing something else and the general counsel who's frankly, where the buck stops when things get bad, is not involved, um, then you're going to have a terrible mess. And also, a, your CEO really needs to understand AI because otherwise, how can they do their visioning of where the company is going? So that C-suite level needs training um, and understanding, and they need to be working together. And I think the other thing that I would recommend is if you give everybody an education 101 on AI, it will help them to understand what AI can do, what it might do, and what they might do in their jobs with AI. And there is a current phrase that's sort of going around that says you won't lose your job to AI you'll lose your job to a person who knows how to use AI. And empowering your workforce is going to be better for the company and better for them. Absolutely. Is there any case that you remember that might stand out in terms of how governance and managerial skills have merged together uh, successfully? Anything that you, you might want to share on that? 
uh, the CEO of Nokia a long time ago now, probably four or five years ago, actually did make all of the employees go through a 101 on AI because AI was going to be so influential in their company. What we know is that where you have a, a human with an AI, it increases the ability of the human. And so I think at the moment, we're literally on the cutting edge of how leadership and management of AI systems and AI-enabled humans uh, is going to work out. So what, what is the importance of working with the, the right partners uh, for this? Well, obviously, it's absolutely vital to work with the right partners. As I said, a mapping and some real rules that your employees have to follow is the very first thing that you should do. After that, you can look at who are the people who you might trust to um, buy AI from. And last year, or this year at Davos, um, I was on the panel with the CEO of Accenture North America, and he was talking about the fact that most of their work at the moment is undoing poorly conceived, irresponsible AI projects. So putting everything together that we have talked so far, what do you think are the main challenges for expanding AI on a B2B perspective? Whether you're B2B or B2C, procurement's where it starts because you have to procure um, good AI, AI that meets your needs. And if you don't have anybody who can help you ask the right questions, then you're almost like the wolf with the sheep. One of the problems is that everybody's being expected and told that they've got to do AI, but they're not at a point of sufficient education to be able to do AI. AI is not going to fit in every, in every piece of the, your jigsaw. You're, uh, so the best deployment and the best first deployment is going to have been very well thought out and then you deploy it and then you see how it works. Don't try and deploy it over everyone. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to be very thoughtful. What can I use AI for? What can, what, how do I buy the AI and then move forward from there? Um, and also check your data. If you haven't got good data, you can't use AI in the first place. Yeah, th that's great. And a quick uh, follow-up on this. Do you think there are some sectors that are more mature to use AI? How do you view these particularities? Yeah, absolutely. And there are um, areas where more where people are using AI and managing it well. Banking is a great example. Um, it's a highly regulated industry. They've been using AI for a long time, and they're thinking about the government's issues because they're already regulated and they know that they have to. We are seeing some fairly reckless uses of AI, as I said earlier, in healthcare and in education. Governments actually have to do more because they're working for citizens and they owe their citizens a duty of care. So you're going to need to ha have transparency and explainability. The public sector has more to do in this area. A lot of people look at AI only uh, as the results that AI produce, but AI is all about infrastructure that actually enables it work. So that might be cloud computing, uh, 5G networks, and even cybersecurity, which is very important for anything digital. What is the role of this infrastructure in your view? Yeah, absolutely. You can't, as I said earlier, you can't have AI without data. You can, of course, have AI without data because you can use an LLM. But if you're using an, uh, an LLM, you are then just using the data off the internet. And that use isn't going to be terribly good use for your business. 
So that's where cloud computing comes in because you can use some of the LLM models um, through an API on your own data. I want to just also mention cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is under threat of all time. And all my friends who work in cybersecurity and all the people I meet in, all the CISOs I meet in my work, they're actually just using AI to fight off the AI attacks. And um, as we come up to the Christmas season, a great example of that is in retail, where um, they are just waiting for the hundreds and thousands of bot attacks on retail um, to defraud, to buy things fraudulently, for example. So um, CISOs are vital and um, AI to counter AI is really the only way that you can do cybersecurity anymore. In your view, uh, Kay, how should we approach AI regulation? What are the most exemplary models that you think would be adequate for regulating AI? Ah, uh, yes. Well, actually, I think it depends where you are and how big a company you are. When, when, I, were, when I first started in this, there wasn't any regulation. And so we did a lot of work around self-regulation. There are existing laws that um, are being used to regulate AI um, in the absence of regulation. Copyright laws, for example, and we've seen, certainly seen a number of cases against OpenAI, um, the New York Times against OpenAI, for example. And then, of course, there's the legislation that we're seeing gradually coming up around the world. The EU AI Act is probably the star there in exactly the same way as the GDPR was in terms of privacy. So there's lots to look at. But if I were a company in Brazil and I was expecting the act, I'd just go there. By the way, Brazil is right now debating, as you mentioned, uh, our own AI law, which is very much inspired uh, by the EU AI Act. What is your advice at the country level? Do you think Brazil should follow Europe or would there be other uh, possibilities for approaching AI regulation at the country level? Well, I think there's always other possibilities and the EU AI Act is one way of looking at, at risk. It's interesting to think about us talking about AI as not needing any governance. Why should it be the only technology that we don't govern, especially as it's the only technology that actually is trying to mimic the way that we think and what we do and what we can do with both our brains and through robotics with our bodies. Great points. And Kay, let me thank you so much for sharing these ideas uh, with us. I'm actually looking forward even more to our conversation in Brazil with Embratel uh, next year in 2025. And it will be amazing to have you here in Brazil. So thank you so much, Kay. It was great talking to you. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure.